Oh my gosh, Karen, this is it. What's it? This, the show, this is it. This is what I've been looking for the entire time. Oh, that it. Yeah, this is it, it. Right? <laughs> the it. The it. People who listen to the show know it. I'm all about finding proof, tangible proof. Like I could see it, I could touch it, I could taste it, I can feel it. I thought you were starting to get a little bit better off that. I, well, I am, I am, but it's always nice to get the actual, like in your face proof. Mm. And this is it. <laughs> now, I mean, I'm so excited. Like, I don't even know. Like, I'm jumping around. Like, we just did the recording, and now we're recording this because we were too, I was too excited. Like, I'm giddy. I'm giddy I with know. what we're about to reveal. Okay. Now, we need to warn you. This is a little bit longer of an episode. It's actually quite a bit longer. Yeah, quite a bit longer. It's our longest episode to date, but it is chock full of stuff that you are going to want to stick around for, for Absolutely. sure. Absolutely. Especially if you have a few doubts here and there. Yeah. If you have any doubt whatsoever, about this, the woo. about the, about the fact that this stuff really exists or not, this is the show that may just put all those doubts for you to rest. And I don't say that lightly because I started the show with big time doubts. And we're going to reveal some information that has never before been revealed. Not yeah. like this. Not like this. Exactly. We have a doctor coming up that actually, well, I don't want to spoil it. Stick around. It's long, but it is worth it. We promise you. I am so flipping giddy, Karen. I can't, <laughs> I'm, I can't contain myself. I know. All right. Let's just start the show. Here we go. Karen. Yes. You remember our friend Jennifer Foster. Of course I do. Right, right. Of course. I mean, she was, her interview was astounding. It really was. Uh, she's the person. And if you haven't heard the interview before you listen to this one, go find hers and listen to that one first. I promise you, you'll get a lot more out of this interview if you do that. But she's the one who just up and had to travel the world because she was awakening spiritually and didn't know how to handle it. What she was doing that she gained ability after ability. Now, in her search, she found, or maybe a doctor found her, that asked her to map her brain while she was performing these abilities. That's so interesting. Yeah, it absolutely is. And the best thing is that we've got both of them on the show today, and the doctor is going to reveal what his findings were Ooh. on the show. So this was one you don't want to miss. Stay with us. We'll be right back here on The Skeptic Metaphysicians. My name is Will. And I'm Karen. And unlike Mulder and Scully, we both want to believe. So we've embarked on a journey of discovery. We've talked to people deeply entrenched in the spiritual and metaphysical world. We've thrown ourselves into weird and wonderful experiences. I even joined a coven of witches. And, wait, you joined a coven? Yep, all in the interest of finding something. Anything. That will prove that there's something beyond this physical. Three-dimensional world we all live in. This is The, the Skeptic, Skeptic Metaphysicians. Metaphysicians. Welcome to the Skeptic Metaphysicians. I'm Will. And I'm Karen. And today we have a special treat. And I know I say that sometimes, but this is truly a special <laughs> treat because it goes right up both of our alleys, Karen. Right? Mm -hmm. We've got Jennifer Foster, who is a channel, a medium, a healer. She works with spirit energy. She also has a spirit family that helps others emotionally, energetically, physically, and spiritually. But it wasn't always this way. She was and still is a very well-respected broadcaster in the production industry. Mm -hmm. And she understandably was a little uh, hesitant, freaked out <laughs> when she started her spiritual awakening, started happening. Uh, so that's a, a little bit of background. Uh, she traveled the world looking for answers as her abilities turned on one by one. And her latest adventure took her to Dr. Tarrant, who has now successfully mapped her brain while performing her abilities. And Dr. Tarrant, well, he's a founder and director of psychic mind science and the neuro meditations institute in eugene oregon he is a licensed psychologist and board certified in neurofeedback he specializes in teaching clinical applications and research combining technology-based interventions with meditative states that improve mental health and his research focuses on exploring brainwave changes that happen as a result of non-ordinary states of consciousness and PSI-related abilities. I was going to say PSI-related abilities, but I don't know if that's true. <laughs> and he's also the author of the books, Meditation Interventions to Rewire the Brain and Becoming Psychic. I am so 
flipping excited to welcome Dr. Tarrant and Jennifer Foster to the show. Thank you guys for both coming on. Oh, it's so nice to be here. Thanks for having us. Yeah, for sure. I appreciate the opportunity. Well, I would say the opportunity is ours because having... Okay, let me back up because I'm, I'm a little too excited. I, need to, need I to... know. I feel like we should have that applause <laughs> when they're <laughs> yeah, here. <laughs> I know. So, so the reason why I'm so excited, Doc, is because Jennifer is was one of the first people that we had on the show that was helping us to understand this non-ordinary consciousness thing experience that people are having. That works really well, except when you're really a pragmatic and you have a hard time wrapping your head around things. So then to have someone like you who has spent many, many years researching this and actually now you've taken Jennifer and had her channel and you had this thing on her head and you mapped <laughs> her brain and we are going to find out what was happening in her mind, which is, that is super exciting. I got to tell you, that is evidence, right? That we've been looking for that this, there's something happening that's not usual, right? Right. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's tricky, right? Because we can't, I can't necessarily look at the brain waves and say, well, this proves something. And at the same time, some of the patterns that we saw are very significantly different than kind of just a normal state of consciousness. So something's happening for sure, right? We can absolutely say that. Right, right. Well, just like when I was, when I first attuned to Reiki and that was my first feel of something else beyond the physical because I actually felt the energy for the first time, this is a way for us to see that for sure there is something out of the norm happening here. So to me, that's super exciting. That's tantamount to proof as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> yeah, Because you need that proof. Uh, yes, you too. Yes, him, him too, Karen. Yes. <laughs> I, I needed that proof. This is, this is why I, I yeah. really need proof. You know, there's a big part of me that says, I just want to see what my brain is doing when I'm not really here. When I just kind of step aside, I'd love to see what's going on with my brain. My my mind is doing very different things now. And so being able to work with Dr. Tarrant and have him do that, the EEGs and the brain mapping and the other work that we've done together was just such a relief to me, really. It was a validation. And he's explained to me so many times what statistically significant means and this and that. And a lot of times my eyes just kind of glaze over, but I, <laughs> then I look at the images and go, okay, that makes sense. So yeah. I, 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 we've had that opportunity. Well, I like the term statistically. Oh, never mind. I'm not going to do that. <laughs> because I do, I do. I like, I like the, that the probability of that being um, something significant is huge. So um, mm -hmm. And I can only imagine the val validity that brought to your experience, because I remember when we last talked, you were at first questioning your sanity for a mm -hmm. while with all this kind of stuff. And, and we've heard it from other people afterwards, too. So, sure. Um, yeah. And I think that's pretty typical. And, and Dr. Mm -hmm. Tarrant can speak to that, too, with other um, psychics, mediums, channels, healers. When the abilities turn on in such a dramatic way, it's, it's very disorienting. And I think we're all searching for, for answers and learning to discern energy, and that takes time. And it's been two years since we spoke last, so there's been an extraordinary amount of experiences that I've had, and validation in some cases just working with people, the, being able to see the results and, and knowing that I, I am definitely channeling. It's, it's not that- uh, You're not making it up or something. There's no question of that anymore. Mm -hmm. that, there, there's not a question of that, but understanding the mechanics of it is what's interesting to me. How is it possible that our brains are able to do this? And, and that's what I find really fascinating about Dr. Tarrant's work and the book that um, he just recently released, which is called Becoming Psychic. And he's worked with lots of different mediums and channels. And what's been great for me is to be able to talk with him and say, this is my experience. And he'll say, oh, that's interesting because that's very similar to what so-and-so would say. Mm -hmm. So it, mm -hmm. it is nice to see that there mm -hmm. are some things that are kind of lining up here that are consistent. And then we all have our own way of doing this, right? We're all individuals. So we all have our own way of being able to work with the energy, to process the energy, to be a vessel for this energy. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's becoming much more normal and natural for me now. And still, it's, it's, it's still a little strange. Still out there, still woo. Yeah, wow. they're woo, you know? Yeah. Well, I want to get into the whole what's going on in your brain, and we have some really great images. Before we get into that, it has been two years, and you said you've had some significant experiences that have happened. What kind of significant experiences? That's got me excited. Oh, 
I think I have to come back on to talk about some of those because um, I'm in the process of writing a book about some of them. And I mean, I, it's been everything from doing what's called en entity extractions, which some people may call exorcisms. Um, what? I've had these experiences. I've had another almost near-death experience with me, which I think you're familiar with the, the being thrown from the camel and almost dying and that experience. Mm -hmm. And then how that lined up afterwards. I mean, the universe is just continues to amaze me and the things, the way that things unfold and the way things happen. But I've been all over the world since we, we spoke. And I think the last time I spoke with you, I had already been around the world twice. So I was guided very clearly to go to Israel and Palestine in July. And I ended up spending a month there in August before going on to Rwanda in September. All of that was guided. That was just go here. It's the last opportunity you'll have to do this. And now look at what's going on in that part of the world. Yeah. So there are so many things and experiences like I've really been living in these villages where I travel to and where I go to. And part of it is because it's very natural to be able to go to a, a, a place on the other side of the world and do this work. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't have to worry about malpractice insurance. I don't have to worry about any reason. <laughs> yeah. I'm not a doctor. I can just sit with people and sense into their energies and beautiful healings happen sometimes. And so I've had extraordinary experiences where I was sitting with three women in Morocco and we kind of went around the circle and one had a back problem, one had a knee problem. And we get, I got to the third one and my guide said, just sit next to her for a minute. And I couldn't really sense anything. And she said, just sit next to her. So I did, and I thought maybe it was just to settle my own energies because I'd just done pretty significant work with two, two people. And when you're in a group, it's a little bit more challenging. And as I sat next to her, my main guide, Adriana, said, she has a baby in her belly. Can you feel it? And now I've never had a baby, so I don't know what that feels like, right? <laughs> but I was able to sense into my body. So there's so many things like that. I mean, and, and and my psychic abilities have really expanded to the point that I'll know if someone's pregnant and I'll know what their, the sex of their baby is going to be before I even see them or be with them. It's very strange types of things that have just kind of turned on and some of them have escalated and some of them have kind of gone back to the point. I think well, the first time we talked, I talked about 2017 being the years of weird when it just came on full blast, all that psychic knowing. That's back now. And there was a little bit of lull in that as I was opening up to the channeling and as I was really focused on being a trans channel. But now it's, they're pretty, it's pretty turned on. I want to turn our attention now for a minute to mm -hmm. Dr. Tarrant because now we just heard Jennifer talk about all of her experiences, what she's been going through, how things are back and abilities are, are strengthening and things like that. When you hear someone say that, as a as an academic, you wouldn't think that you would be going, yeah, it sounds right. Because you were nodding the whole time as she was talking about it. Like, it makes sense to you. But th th was there ever a time when you uh, turned to someone that's saying this to you and went, how did I get here? I'm <laughs> <laughs> believing that right now. <laughs> <laughs> How did I get here? Uh, <laughs> um, I, yes. I mean, certainly there are times where it's, this is so weird. How did my career path end up here? And it's interesting because uh, not the same at all, right? But I feel like the universe has kind of put some of these situations in my path. And I said, yes. And so it's in, at least at this point in the way that I see things and the way that I understand things, it's like, if you say yes, then it sends you to the next thing and they, it just kind of keeps unfolding. And for whatever reason, it's starting to feel like maybe this is what I'm supposed to be doing because so much of this work has just unfolded so naturally and easily and things just keep kind of landing in my lap. And from the beginning, I wasn't looking for any of this. I didn't set out. I didn't say, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go study psychics and mediums. It was, yeah, <laughs> I'm not sure that Jennifer was looking for it either. Yeah, and yet. <laughs> I was wondering how that first yes felt. <laughs> <laughs> now, so you have studied not just Jennifer, but several people. I've watched a presentation that you've done on these types of things. I even went to your website. I downloaded your meditation. You have meditations on your site that people can download for free who will Ooh. 
that will activate that part of your brain that you're using when you're having. I mean, what? How? What? You're a doctor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, and, and and actually, this is why I have two different websites. Is uh, <laughs> because honestly, and, and it kind of gets to your to your initial question just a second ago is when I first started being more open about this work and being more vocal about it and putting things out there to me, it didn't seem like a big deal. It was, yeah, sure. And not surprisingly, I got some pushback from certain professional communities. And in fact, I got Mm -hmm. fired from a group that I was working with in Germany who shall remain nameless, but you can compensate. (laughs) Right. But it was was a group I was working with in Germany and, and they were using a lot of my meditation work as part of their programming. And when they found out I was doing this, I got an email from them that basically said, since you're no longer interested in science, we, we think we should part ways. And I was like, they did oh, not. Oh my gosh. That is all. So first that wow. you're interested in, you're no longer interested in science. Yeah. Second, that they did it with an email. How <laughs> rude. <laughs> wow. Wow. Yeah. I mean, my, so at that point, my solution or whatever was I was like, okay, you know what? I'll separate this a little bit. Anybody that Googles me, it, it, it's, you're going to see both things, but it, kind of keeping some of the neuro meditation stuff separate from the psychic mind mm-hmm. science stuff. I mean, I understand yeah. for some people, this is too much for them to digest and it makes them uncomfortable. And so mm-hmm. I don't want to eliminate those people from some of the other work. So I guess it's the price you got to pay, right? <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I, 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 yeah. unfortunately, unfortunately, that is the case that now yeah. in, in, this, in this world. Hopefully soon enough, it won't be anymore. Mm. People will re- realize, you know, I don't know. That's, that's the, amazing though. Yeah. You have mapped out all these folks who are using their abilities and you found uh, some astounding things are happening in your estimation. And we'll go through the results here, but before, but without getting, giving anything away, do you feel that anybody can develop these types of abilities or does someone... Wait, because for example, Jennifer had a near death experience. She had a, an accident that that at, with upon hitting her head, actually, perhaps might have triggered some of these things to come out. Mm-hmm. Do, do I have to m- knock my head against the wall to start having psychic abilities, or can we develop those? I, I can help you with that. Well, <laughs> you volunteered a little too fast, Karen. Yeah, I was gonna say that, that that's an advanced type of technique, right? But, So, uh, and again, this is just my current feeling. And some of it comes from talking to a lot of different mediums and psychics and what their opinion is, but as well as just my own experience is is that, yes, indeed, I think we all sort of have this innate ability. I I actually think it's a natural ability that we're born with. And I think what happens is that as we get older, as our brain changes, because your brain waves change as you get older, they actually become more rigid, not a big surprise there. And as we develop more language skills and more, we get rewarded for analysis and for left brain kind of ways of thinking and engaging. And we get told by our family group and our society, that's not real. Don't pay attention to that. I think what happens is the brain starts to essentially inhibit those natural abilities. And so I think the reason that you see a lot of times that, so Jennifer is a good example, but I've seen lots of mediums and psychics where They've had a traumatic head injury or they've had a seizure or they've had some other traumatic event that seemed to trigger an opening of some of this. And there's other research that supports this idea that basically when that happens, I think what you're doing is you're getting the brain out of the way. So if you're lucky enough, I'm going to put it in air quotes, that type of an injury doesn't create some sort of damage where you're not, it's hard to function, right? but it's isolated enough where it disinhibits the brain so that these abilities can kind of come forth just more easily. So I think that's why it's easier for some people than others, right? Is that the brain is just has an easier, an easier way to shut down the parts that are causing problems. Doc, that is uh, the critical point, right? Mm -hmm. That you, the, the point that you just made about stopping the function of certain areas is actually what makes these things happen, which is actually interesting because you think you need to activate some areas, but according to your research, it's actually just the opposite. Jennifer, turning to you, I think you agree that almost everyone can channel, but there's different types of channeling. And I don't, I can't imagine anyone who would be better 
serve to help us understand the differences be- between those. Yeah, thank you. But it's interesting because I did a lot of neuro meditation after my cycling crash to help rewire my brain and to help heal my brain because I had a mild traumatic brain injury and also I was having cognitive disturbances. I was having visual disturbances, all kinds of issues. And so in order to heal my brain, I really dove deep into meditation. And so now I see Dr. Terrence's book and I go, oh yeah, I learned all of this as I was healing my brain. And it's interesting because when I'm doing sessions with people, they'll say, like, how can I do this? Everybody wants to channel. And I'm always saying, mm-hmm. careful what you wish for, right? Yeah, <laughs> right. And what my guides will tell them sometimes is that they're efforting too much, that instead of efforting, just allow, just learn to quiet the mind, quiet your brain and become the observer. And when you can become the observer, then you can discern energies and our thinking brains and our imagination want to get engaged in that process. But if you can train your brain, and sometimes it, it helps to get hit by a van and have the <laughs> brain. <laughs> um, but uh, when you can train the brain to become the observer, and then you recognize that your mind is so much greater than that brain, right? It's You're really sensing into all of the energies. We're energy beings, so that's what we're doing. We're sensing into energies. And so I think we're all channels. We can all be cha- channels. It's just the difference, I think, is that some have the ability to discern subtle vibrations and really be able to hone in on those. And that takes practice. And sometimes, like what happened with me, all of a sudden just hearing that was jarring and I had to learn how to work with energy, how to discern energy, how to perceive, receive, discern. Discernment was the the big one. Sure. So, yeah, there are three types of channeling. And so trance channeling is what I do now, which is... Basically, my brain steps aside, and you'll see this in the, in the I think you're going to see it I'm here soon, or, or Dr. Tian's going to talk about it, but my brain just kind of steps aside so that those energies can come through. So I'm really a vessel for those energies. And really, for me, it's become very easy to be able to do that, to just become the observer. And so when I allow the energies to come through, they take over my voice. Sometimes they take over my body, my movement. Certainly when I'm doing healing work, my hands go right to where they need to. I don't control any of it. In fact, my guides say, stay out of the way, stay out of the way, stay out of the way. That's got to be freaky, right? It's got to freak you out a little bit. I mean, it's become, it's interesting because I never really know. Like we, Dr. Tanner and I did some work with someone my hands were in all kinds of different positions. I don't know whether that's exactly where they need to be. I'm not a trained medical professional. I don't know the, (laughs) I don't know the mechanics of any of this. Right. And then we read her, I read her feedback just yesterday, I think it was. And she said her hands went to exactly the spot of the concern. How does that happen? I stay out of the way. I just stay out of it. Right. And I let spirit guide and do what's meant to do. And those people's higher selves, those humans, they're more expansive, their energetic selves are in charge just as much as I am in in that situation, more so in some cases. So Mm. I'm just following that energy. So that's, so the trance is me just getting out of the way. And then there's two other types of channeling that are more, more common. I think intuitive channeling is what I think we almost all of us are. Everybody has the ability to listen to their own intuition to their gut feelings, to their own sense of knowing. I'm I'm sure this is something that all three of you can relate to, that you just have this knowing, right? That something is, just is, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think almost everyone has the ability to tap into their intuition. So everyone is a channel because that's coming from our most expansive self. It's coming from our energetic self. And then there's conscious channeling. And this is what I do as a psychic and a medium, and most psychics and mediums and and healers do this work, and that's where you receive those downloads of information. So you're connecting with spirit and or the energy of people and places and things, and you may not really understand how or why, but you know that you're receiving that information. And so this happens probably with a lot of us also, where we have that really strong knowing and that's when we're, temp- we're tapping into our clairs, our psychic clair senses. And we can go into what those six are if you want. But that is that conscious channeling. And that conscious channeling is where I think we can all evolve and we can all learn and we can all grow. And part of that has to start with meditation because we have to be able to quiet our minds to get our thinking brains out of the way in order for 
all of that other clear sensing to come through. Right. Yeah. And, and the clears, is, of course, we, we talked about it a lot on the show, clairvoyance, clairaudience, clairsentience, all that kind of stuff. So, yeah. oh my gosh. All right. I <laughs> have been so patient. I have been sitting on the edge of my seat. I really, I mean, I've got to see these results. And we got we to gotta listen to Dr. Taren talk about the results. We will not make you wait any longer. And by you, I mean me. Before we reveal all that stuff, just a quick disclaimer. If you're only listening to this show, I urge you to go either to our blog, we'll post the pictures there, or go to our YouTube channel and watch this because uh, Dr. Terrence is going to be speaking to us certain slides that he has uh, sent to us with results. So you'll see those visually. But meanwhile, you'll get a good sense as he's talking through it on the audio side. So don't worry, you're not missing out too much, but I do recommend you check the pictures out if you get a chance, skepticmanifestation.com. I'll remind you that a little bit later on in the show. But okay, Doc, without further ado, yeah, the floor is yours. <laughs> what the scoop? <laughs> All right. So take it away. The reason I included this this image is just so people can get an idea of what it looks like uh, when we're kind of doing these brainwave recordings. So this is a 19-channel EEG cap. So it's measuring and monitoring 18 or sorry, 19 different areas of the brain simultaneously. And that's really enough to get a pretty good picture of what's going on throughout the brain, as well as different ways of looking at connectivity between parts of the brain. So, that, and, and that was actually, you can see Jennifer's kind of looking off a little bit to the right, which seems to be, well, we've worked together a few different times now, and that seems to be a way that she naturally shifts her body posture when she starts channeling, kind of shifting her head a little bit as if she's looking to the right. Her eyes are closed, obviously, but this was actually during one of her channeling sessions. Mm, yeah, I remember that look when she was uh, doing it for me uh, on a session. She would do that uh, with her head, so I, I, I recognize it very right, right away. Yeah, and so this the first. So we actually have done three sessions together, and the first one was straight up channeling. Right, just did a couple of baseline recordings because, of course, in order to look and see what the brain's doing during channeling, the best way to look at that is you have to compare it to something else. Mm -hmm. And the most obvious thing to compare it to is to compare it to Jennifer's brain when she's not channeling. Sure. So we did several baselines, right? We did eyes open, eyes closed, sitting, doing nothing. And then we also had her do a, an EEG recording while she was just having a regular conversation. And the reason that's important is because when she's doing the channeling work, she's also speaking out loud. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking, it can actually, it interferes with the EEG because the muscle movement and that sort of thing gets picked up by the EEG. And so by having a conversation compared to channeling, we can essentially subtract the two from each other. So in, in that regard, then you're basically saying, well, what's different between just having a regular conversation and channeling? And so that's actually what we're looking at in this set of images is the difference between those two conditions. And so I've got the primary EEG brain waves labeled at the top of these little heads. I left out delta. So usually you'll see from the slowest brain waves to the fastest, delta, theta, alpha, beta, high beta, gamma. So your brain makes a lot of different frequencies. And what we're able to do is kind of split them apart. So it's a little bit like the colors of the rainbow, right? All the colors of the rainbow have different frequencies. Mm -hmm. And so do your brain waves. Your brain waves have different frequencies. So you can think of these like the colors of the rainbow. Some are slower, some are faster. The reason I left Delta out is because there was muscle movement involved by talking and muscle movement usually looks like Delta in an EEG. So just to keep it as clean as possible, I just said, let's just not look at that. So the way to look at these brain maps is that any of the areas that are essentially green basically means there wasn't really any significant difference between having a conversation and channeling. It was kind of the same activity. Anywhere where there's brighter colors, yellow, then orange, then red, means there was an increase of that activity during the channeling, and we don't see any of that. Anywhere where there's blues, kind of lighter blues moving into deeper blues, means there was a decrease of activity during the channeling. And so at a, at a high level, kind of looking at this, what, what you can see right away is that basically everything decreased. So theta decreased, alpha decreased, beta, all of them decreased. And it was the most dominant in the slower frequencies, 
and you can see it largely up in the frontal lobes in the frontal lobes and kind of maybe leaning over to the left a little bit. So if you look at alpha and beta in particular, actually, you can see it in high beta pretty well, too, that there's a little bit more deactivation on the left hemisphere for a couple of reasons. So first, I mean, just like we talked about earlier, Jennifer's brain was basically <laughs> shutting down to some degree, right? Everything was decreasing. So the, the normal brain functions were reduced, if you want to think of it that way, the way the brain normally operates. And then the, the areas that showed up the strongest with that were the frontal lobes, which makes sense, right? Because that's like executive functions, thinking, planning, analyzing, all that stuff, which of course, if you're getting out of the way, you're not doing any of that. So it makes sense that all of those functions would shut down. What's interesting is that there is this kind of leaning over to the left side of the brain where you see more deactivation because that's where all the language centers are. And so it's interesting because in both cases, she was speaking, she was talking, she was using language, but clearly the way she was using language is different. It's different if you're in your normative consciousness and having a conversation, right? Because that involves thinking, planning, organizing your thoughts, listening to the other person, interpreting what's being said versus allowing the words to just move through you where there's no internal narrative or a sort of structure around that. Just so make sure that I understand, because I can be really thick some, about this stuff, but that slide was when she was channeling Adriana. We all know that Adriana is her main spirit guide. And as she got deeper into it, she there was less activity in the brain, which makes sense because she's stepping out of the way, as she mentioned before, and allowing Adriana to come through, right? So that that makes sense to me. The, now on the bottom below, yes, right, the, 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 another part of that slide where yeah. is this highlight on Cuneus or something like that. And yeah, talk yeah. to us about that. Well, the only reason that I kind of put that on there at all is just because the, the Cuneus is, you can kind of see it's high, well, you can barely see it. It's kind of hidden just a little bit, but it's at the very back of the brain. And so you can see the blues, the really deep blues at the very back. So mm -hmm. I was highlighting just a sp specific area of the brain called the Cuneus. And the reason I did that is because on the top images, you really can't see it very well because we're looking at the surface on those top images. And the cuneus is a deeper brain region that we're able to, to look at with this special imaging uh, technique. And I highlighted that because that was one of the areas that decreased activity the most. And so one of the things that's interesting about that is one of the things the cuneus is involved in is visual processing. And so again, it's kind of like that language thing, I think, right? That when we're have engaged in a normal conversation, we're hanging out, even if my eyes are open, we're still seeing things in our head. We're getting pictures in our mind. We're imagining things, especially if our eyes are closed. You're laying in bed before you go to sleep. You're getting pictures in your mind. You're thinking about things. You're remembering things that are visual. It's an active process. And so Again, to me, what it suggests is that whatever kind of visual information Jennifer was getting when she was channeling, it wasn't conscious, right? Like that whole thing just kind of shut off. Nothing to do with her. Like she wasn't creating that. That would be my interpretation. Yeah. yeah. I love that. Jennifer, what thoughts? Wow, right? When he first showed me these and was walking me through it, he, he said, so here, where'd you go? And I'm like, that's what I want to know. Where do I go? <laughs> where is the me yeah. sitting here talking to you right now? Where do I go? Because I really, I, I really do my best to not interfere whatsoever and to not have my own thoughts. And, right. and when I do have the thoughts, I absolutely observe them because I know that it is kind of getting into the mix, especially if I'm channeling with someone else, I don't want to interrupt what's coming through. Right. And so, yeah, that, that was my question too, is like, where, where did I go? <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Tarrant, where did she go? Can you map that? <laughs> I wish. Yeah. I, th there's a lot of things I wish I could do that the technology hasn't figured it out yet. So. Okay. Do you yeah. remember what you're channeling? Yes. Most of the time. Most of the time, I'm not so deep in a trance that I'm not aware of what's being said. You know, I, I, my memory is not so great anymore, honestly. <laughs> yeah. so I, I don't, I don't remember every detail that mm -hmm. is discussed, but I do remember it's if I were just observing a conversation. And does it, do you hear actual words in your head or is it just 
like a knowing like feeling. It depends on what I'm doing. So in what we were doing there was trans channeling. And so, no, I hear it as it's coming out of my, my mouth, I, I like really like an observer. I don't control it and I don't know what's going to be said until it's said. And so I'm, that's it. I'm an audience in oh. that way. In some cases, there are other times where I hear and then I will share that. Sometimes mm -hmm. I'm channeling someone that's not my team or if it's another spirit or someone loved one or even animals or, you know, mm -hmm. I'll hear trees. I mean, I will hear yeah. and then I have to go, okay, I heard that. And then I will, and then I'll say it back. But I, when I'm doing this type of channeling work, it really is. And I, mm -hmm. I tell people that all the time. I have no idea what's going to be said. The vulnerability that's involved in that, I, I, Ooh, that's my biggest, huge. my biggest challenge really is yeah. I don't control it. So I always want everything to be said that's said to be aligned with my integrity and truthful and beautiful and all of those things. Mm -hmm. and, and once it's out of my mouth, uh, right. So it, it explains a lot when I'm driving the car and someone cuts me off. I definitely don't know what's coming out of my mouth. That must be what's happening, right? That, it's got to be. <laughs> You're channeling something. Uh, yeah. I don't think yeah. you can, can blame that on uh, channeling your highest self. I don't think oh, that. Come on, Doc. Yeah. It's only a bone. There's a difference. If the ego gets involved in there sometimes too, right? right. That's, what, that's they, what has to stay in check during the right. channeling is, is the ego. Well, then you, doctor, you also had Jennifer, not just channel Adriana, you also had her do some other things. And we've got another slide that we'll go to now, if that seems right to you. Sure. Yeah. And, and this can be relatively brief. Jennifer switched from channeling Adriana to more of an angelic being that, and Jennifer, you can correct me, but is kind of part of her team of guides, helpers, wh whatever the right term is. Is that fair, yep. Jennifer? That's okay. right. Uh, so the reason I was saying we don't need to linger on this too long is because actually the images are pretty similar. If you look at this and you look at the other one, the, the patterns are similar. It's a huge decrease. This one actually looks like there's maybe a little bit of an increased decrease. That doesn't make sense. There's, uh, <laughs> I was uh, thinking that though. <laughs> yeah, yeah. A, a stronger decrease. There's more or less. Yeah, yeah. There's more or less. There's a, strong, <laughs> a stronger decrease of activity, which may or may not be relevant. But the other thing that I wanted to highlight on the bottom on this one was I'm looking at gamma activity and Gamma is the fastest brainwave that we measure, and it's involved in lots of different things. But at a real basic level, it's, it's got the, the closest connection to blood flow of any of the brainwaves. So when there's more gamma, there tends to be more blood flow, less gamma, less blood flow. So those areas are shut down. And so again, I highlighted a couple of the areas that showed up strongly. And there's the occipital lobe again, the back of the, the head, that visual processing. So not a big surprise because we saw that with Adriana. But then also the inferior parietal lobule, you can see the little wings kind of on the back quadrants of the brain. And then the posterior cingulate, which is a deeper structure kind of in the middle and toward the back central of the mm. brain. And those two areas are really important in this case because both the inferior parietal and the posterior cingulate are major parts of something called the default mode network in the brain. And the default mode network primary job is creating a sense of identity. It's kind of like the physical structure of our ego. So how we define ourselves, who we are, how we see ourselves, how we see ourselves in connection with the rest of the world. So you see these like basically shutting down. And so I think that's really relevant. It's also a similar pattern to what you see with people when they're in a psychedelic state hmm. is that the default mode network shuts down. It gets out of the way huh. so that you can open up to larger possibilities. Right. So I now, thought that was pretty cool. Very cool. Very cool. So that posterior cingulate to me surprisingly close to where people believe the the, the pineal gland thank you yes the pineal <laughs> gland right could could that possibly be the mythical pineal gland in action right there i don't think so uh, the pineal gland is going to be a little bit deeper and I, I really can't get close enough with this kind of imaging to see the pineal that, that's a question that always comes up can God. you see the pineal gland it's like, well <laughs> Not really. It's a little too deep for this kind of imaging. And so, but I do think sometimes we can get a, what's the word that I want? A proxy of what's mm. going on with the pineal gland by, from right at the center. So dead square in the center of the crown. I think sometimes when we're seeing interesting activity there, it may be related to pineal gland activity. Okay. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm yeah. sorry. I'm yeah, geeking I've, I've got a cool bit. job. <laughs> you have cool. a cool oh my job. Gosh. Yeah. All right. Ah, German people. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, the next slide, next picture is a, a photo of Jennifer working with someone else with the same little shower caps on. <laughs> yep. Yeah, they're matching. They have matching shower caps. <laughs> yeah. And so what we were doing here was, so this was the second time Jennifer came up and we decided to focus on healing. And we did two different sessions with the same person. And so this was a friend of mine who volunteered to participate and she did have some stuff that she wanted to work on. So that was great. We did two different sessions. One that was, and maybe Jennifer could describe them, but one was more of a channeling healing, or that's what I'm calling it. And one was a more of a hands-on energy healing with the volunteer on the massage table. Jennifer, I don't know if you wanted to say more about that. No, that, that's really what it was. The first was Adriana and my guides were speaking with her and talking with her about some of her emotional challenges, some of which were linked to some of her physical challenges, some things that were going on in her physical body. And so we very quickly kind of got to it. And so we spent a, a little bit of time just in kind of like talk therapy, really, but coming from just extraordinarily beautiful beings who have some insight that I certainly don't, right? Yeah. <laughs> That's so, an extraordinary counselor right there. <laughs> yeah. Ooh, yeah. yeah, so we, so we spent, I don't know, maybe 10 minutes doing that, maybe longer. It could be 10 minutes, it could be 10 hours. I never know when I'm in, you know, when I'm in mm -hmm. such, but we spent some time doing that with her. And then yeah, we, we did some physical body work and that was energy work, which was focused on her, it was cranial sacral work predominantly focused on her head and her neck. And then also some on her leg where she had a, a tumor removed many years ago and was having some challenges in that area also. And so in both of those instances, my, my work when we do that is again, to stay out of the way. And so I don't really know where my hands are going to go. I just get very still and I listen and, and my hands were just guided right to the spots that, that they needed to be, which was, it was great because a lot of times I don't get this kind of feedback from people, but because we were able to monitor it and she was also just so gracious to give feedback directly afterwards and to be honest about her experience, which is really important. She, she wrote a really nice summary of the experience. So that was helpful for me also because my job is to stay out of the way. And so if I'm overthinking it, if I'm over trying to determine what's going on in someone's body, if I start to focus really too much on, okay, we want to heal this person because they're their own best healer, right? It's not me healing them. I'm allowing the energy to travel through me. But if I start to overthink it, then we lose the energy. And so my job really was to stay out of the way. And so Dr. Tarrant was measuring that and also did, in addition to the EEG, there was some kind of a biometric something, something you did. I don't remember what that was. But. <laughs> That's a very scientific term right <laughs> yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, that actually is the technical term for uh, what we are doing. Yeah. Um, <laughs> some, some. <laughs> yeah, we were using it. It's a device. I, I actually don't have the results with me right now, but it's called a bio well. And you may have come across it, but you know, you're basically, it's, it's like using curly and photography on the fingertips, all 10 of the fingertips to sort of extrapolate more about the energy flow in the body. And mm -hmm. it's still a, a technique I'm still trying to get used to. So, but we did a before and after for our volunteer on that. So uh, I still need to dig into those results a bit more to see if there's anything interesting there. Well, it's not like we have a shortage of interesting results to go through. So, Goodness. all right. So then the next slide, yeah, which I'm going to put up right Ooh. now, this was healing, right? Healing yeah. vibes. Yeah, this was the, so this was from the first part of that healing, right? The channeling healing where it was more conversational or, or talk therapy ish. And I use a different software system to analyze the data, which is why the little head maps look a little different, but the color coding is similar, sort of. So really what we're looking at here is, is the percent change, the percent difference of the brain waves. So if you look at the little keys underneath each of the head maps, they're different for each of the brain waves, depending on how much things changed. So the color coding means slightly different things. But of course, the brighter colors mean there was an increase of activity and the cooler colors mean there was a decrease of activity. So what was interesting here is this was very different than what we saw with just the straight channeling, where with the straight channeling, uh, that's what I'm going to call it, just hopefully to make it clear from the first experiment, everything decreased. 
But when healing was involved, there was actually an increase of activity, and it was especially focused in the faster brain waves. So if you look down in that the, the bottom row, high beta, gamma, and high gamma, these are really fast brain waves. And if you look at the keys underneath them, they were increasing up to 95%, 96%, 97%. Good. Wow. Good God. Yeah, that's, that, that's a ridiculous increase uh, of activity, oh right? And it's in these really fast brain waves. So it's interesting because maybe this is the physical way that we measure things that we say are high vibration. Because literally, this is the fastest we can measure the brain. <laughs> and again, what's kind of cool is it's showing up again, where at the back of the head is the strongest. So this more visual activity. So again, I don't know exactly what it means, but what I would wonder is that increase of activity back there related to somehow seeing whatever you want to think about that clairvoyantly or in some other sensory way seeing what's happening during the healing process, right? And engaging with that in a way that's obviously very different from just hanging out and having a conversation. Jennifer, this must be incredibly validating for you because I, as a lay person, can totally see the changes in your brain when you are channeling and just stepping out of the way and then to where you are channeling, but then healing where you're stepping out of the way, but something or someone, something's coming through you and raising, you can clearly see the differences and that to me, I mean, Doc, you say there's not proof, but come on, <laughs> how much more proof would that's someone need? Proofy. Yeah, <laughs> that's incredible. It really is. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's, it's, it's anecdotally, when I'm working with people, they'll, it's, they'll sometimes express what's going on. And that's wonderful. And also to be able to see this and say, okay, I do see that there's something that's actually happening here. Yeah. Um, that's yes. pretty significant. It has been, it's validating, I, I guess is the word for me. Mm -hmm. Although I, the more work that I do, the less doubt that I have that this is truly a gift that I'm so grateful to have been given. Yeah, of course. And what a gift, not just that you got, but the, but the gift that Dr. Tarrant is giving us uh, and giving us a validation, my this is, Doc, you are performing a service, not just to Jennifer, which is a huge for her, mm -hmm. but for humanity, for us to be able to see it with our own eyes that there is something absolutely happening here. So thank you for that for service. so many people that are going through this thinking that they're losing their minds or that they're imagining it or that this can't be real. I mean, this yep. is fantastic for them. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, we got uh, a couple more slides before we're done. I want to, let's go through sure. it. It's quick as we can. Here's the next one. Okay. So this was when Jennifer transitioned over to the massage table. So the volunteer was laying on the massage table and Jennifer described it as more craniosacral-ish, right? You know, kind of putting mm -hmm. hands on and moving to where she was guided. And it's interesting because again, we see this increase of activity, not quite as dramatic as before. If you look at the percentages, but you know, it's still increasing about 50% more than baseline, which again, especially with gamma is a lot. That's a huge mm -hmm. increase. Right. And, but this time it's up in the frontal lobes. So to me, this is all really interesting because it's like, what does all this mean? And it's, well, I don't know exactly, but one of the things, so of course the frontal lobes, we talked before about it being involved in analysis and executive functioning. And obviously, I don't think that's what's going on here, but the frontal lobes are also involved in focused attention. So if you're putting all of your attention in one spot, then those frontal lobes are going to light up. And so it could be possibly some of that. It could have something to do with however the process works for Jennifer. But for me, one of the things that I think is really important to note is that clearly the brain it's shifting dramatically and it's shifting dramatically differently depending on what kind of work Jennifer's doing in that moment. And so I think it points out that even within one gifted medium psychic, that it's not just one thing that's going on. Yeah. It, it depends on what you're doing and how you're engaging that the brain may shift very differently depending on what the exact skill is. Wow. You know what First I think is also interesting about this is that we received feedback from the person that I was working with. And I'm just going to read it to you because I think this is where it gets even more interesting and there's more discovery that we can do. But she said in this one little part, she said, during this por portion of this, this session, I would become aware of my body and notice the intense activation I was experiencing. My whole body was buzzing, tingling, and feeling very light. 
Temperature fluctuations kept happening, but my inner core stayed really warm while my skin felt cool and activated. I could feel myself subtly swaying, moving energy through me. Oh my gosh. So so I'm feeling what's going on in my body. She's feeling what's going on in her body. (laughs) Energy is just like swirling around, right? Wow. And then the brain's doing what it's doing. So I just, it's so beautiful. It you know? is yes. beautiful. And Doc, thank you so much for adding the little noses and, uh, and ears so I know what's front <laughs> and what's back. That's what got me first. Okay, I totally get it now. So yes, uh, the, <laughs> it's pretty obvious. I mean, it's really cool to see the, I mean, I don't know, it, it, it's just so exciting for me because this is the kind of stuff that I've been looking for, right? Mm-hmm. The molder from the X-Files type, I want to believe, but here is even Scully can see it, right? <laughs> there's no doubt. There's no doubt here. So we've got one more slide I want to go through and then sure. we'll uh, we'll go back to our conversation. But this one really, when I saw Ooh. this one, I was like, what? This one's really interesting because it actually talks about that section of the brain that you talked about in your presentation that now I'm really excited to hear you talk about here in our show. Yeah. So the third time that Jennifer came up, because there's always so many different fun experiments to do. So Jennifer was talking about that sometimes she kind of engages in the channeling through more of an automatic writing process where she'll sit at the computer or write things out and just start writing, but it's not coming from her, right? It's mm-hmm. it's coming from one of her guides. So it was like, well, let's try that. So again, we did a baseline of just her, having her type write about whatever. I don't remember what the content was, just something using your, your regular <laughs> normal normative consciousness and then do the channeling and compare the two. So here, again, there's a different pattern. And this time, there's this huge decrease of activity in that same spot in the back of the head. Again, if you look at the fast brain waves, the gamma and, and those, they decreased up to 90%. So it's interesting because on the one uh, during healing, they were increasing by 97, 98%, and now they're decreasing by 90%. That's a huge swing, right? Yeah. It, it speaks again to stepping back. Yeah, to what's going on versus and, stepping forward and healing. Or t- yeah. I mean, that's yeah. That's. I, I think I think it does. And not to get too far into the conversation, but it's interesting too that you see that a lot of those little blue areas of decreased activity are kind of leaning over to the right. If mm-hmm. you can see that. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. So it's really getting close to an area that we talk about called the God spot. It's not yeah. the official term, but there's an area. <laughs> But there's an, there's an area of the brain that, that's right there that has to do with boundaries between self and others. So when you shut that down, what seems to happen is that it makes it easier to connect to information or energies outside of yourself, right? Mm-hmm. Like you got to get rid of the boundaries. You got to get rid of the ego boundaries so that you can reach out. And so I suspect that there's actually a, a piece of that action happening there as well. Oh, Wait. So that's where I need to thwack you, Will. Well, yes. Back of the head. First, yeah, yes. Yeah. But, if, you're gonna, if you're a thwack, Will, that's where you want to hit him, right here. <laughs> I need him right there. <laughs> but then second, oh, do you, this is, that is such a profound thing that you're saying right here. With that part of the brain deals with boundaries. So we've talked a lot about we are all one, right? We're all part of a bigger whole. And mm-hmm. this seems to prove that what we need to do is reconnect with our collective for things to like this to come through losing our identity and becoming bigger than we are in order to, I mean, Oh, by, I mean, I am giddy. This is crazy. (laughs) You know what Uh, is about this and why I really wanted Dr. Tara to do the work while I'm writing is because I've been writing this kid show for a long time. Right. And I'm channeling a lot of it. And I really wanted to be able to say what's going on because it's, this has been a lifelong goal of mine, right? To write this mm-hmm. show. And now it's coming out in different ways than I ever thought imaginable. And I'm channeling a lot of it. And it's challenging for me because it's not what I thought it would be. And I'm seeing new characters come out of nowhere. And I'm reading them the same way as when I'm sitting in a channeling session and I'm hearing something come out of my mouth. And so the, it's been a really strange process for me and also something I'm really excited about because The way that the information is coming through, it's all about what you just said, Will. It's all about unity consciousness. It's all about love. It's all about kindness and empathy and understanding and being with each other and being instead of doing and 
all of the things that the show's for kids. And I think this is the, the most important thing we can be teaching children. Yeah. Um, oh that's, the, that's the type of stuff that's coming through when I'm channeling the show now. And it's been a heck of a couple of years process because, oh, you know, I've been so far imagine. and then it'll stop. And that's the one thing, because I don't control this, I'm living a life of surrender here because there are times where it's like I'm writing, 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 and then it just comes to a complete halt. And that'll happen for months. And I'll recognize, oh, well, I had to learn something else. There was something that came in that I had to, that me personally had to work through. And I, I had to understand more of my own journey before I could continue on and get more information. So I'm being kind of spoon fed from the universe right. and from source. So I'm just like, full information, but I don't control the timing of it either. So uh, yeah. I can't imagine how challenging that must be, especially if this, this has been a dream that you've had for so long and yeah. you've kind of had an idea and now you're kind of out of control of it. Mm -hmm. I came up with the idea about 12 years ago and I've always known it's one of the reasons I'm on this planet is to write the mm -hmm. show. And so now it's a, it's something I didn't see coming. I never yeah. imagined it to be <laughs> what it is right now. Divine timing. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> yeah. But I got literal full body chills as you were talking about that unity consciousness and stuff. That is absolutely what's happening here. And really, some of my favorite books, Conversations with God, Oneness, although they were all channeled works. Yeah. And that is spectacular. So I can only imagine this kid's show is going to be something else. Ooh. I cannot wait to see it. You've done this same mapping thing with other people. Have you found the same types of results with that they're consistent across others as well? Yes and no. That's the kind of answer you want, right? Uh, well, so I can, I, I can answer for you. The, the ones that you did get the same results were the legit ones. The ones that you didn't were the fakers, right? That's what you're going to say. <laughs> uh, not exactly. I, I've actually but, well, I've had the good fortune of the vast majority of the mediums and psychics that I've worked with are very highly skilled. And so I've been lucky in that regard or whatever, right? Uh, divine timing, they, mm -hmm. however it worked out. But so that God spot thing, like that shows up a lot, particularly with mediums. Uh, it shows up frequently, not a hundred percent, but a lot. We also see some of that frontal lobe activation in certain states, especially more psychic states. That shows up pretty consistently. The occipital lobe shows up a lot in different ways, but it varies. Sometimes it decreases activity, sometimes it increases. And so what I suspect is that there are certain brain regions that are important in this work, but how the, the medium or the psychic shifts their brain in order to open up varies. It depends on how their brain works at baseline, right? Because all of our brains are different right now. So why would we all shift them the exact same way? So I think what happens is everybody has to find their own path to, to get the brain shifted so that it can receive whatever the frequencies are. And that might look a little different, even right. though there are certain regions that seem to be pretty consistent. Have you found any difference between people who have just grown and developed their psychic abilities on their own versus people who have had an accident, and a head injury, and, and developed psychic abilities that way? Not so far, but I probably don't have a big enough sample to sort of know that for sure. Mm -hmm. I've probably mapped, I don't know, 20 different mediums at this point. But even that is not enough, right? Because there's so much variability. Because a lot of people will say, oh, I started doing this when I was five years old. And then maybe they also had an accident when they were in their 20s or something. And so it's kind of like, well, what do you do with that, right? right? Or some people who had abilities and then they spent six years of intense training to develop their abilities as well. That's, that might be different than somebody that just has just figured it out, right? right. As they've been kind of going along. Right. Who knows? I think a lot of children have these abilities naturally, right? And then are conditioned out yeah. of them and programmed out of them. And I know mm -hmm. with my own experience, I didn't recognize that not everybody was able to communicate with someone else with their without words, with their mind. And I, I really just thought that was normal. I think that when we look at abilities of children, especially, we see that we come in with a lot of these abilities. And then mm -hmm. as we are kind of conditioned and programmed through our, our childhood, we start layering on trauma and all the things that happen to us. It, it takes us out of our most natural, innate abilities. And so- mm -hmm. I do think that it's something that we can get back to, though, certainly, without having to have a big bonk on the head. <laughs> <laughs>
Yeah, it's a fine line between a, a van hitting you in the street and a death experience. So yeah, but now I'm curious, Doctor, have you mapped any children? Like, how's how young is the youngest person who whose brain you've mapped? Um, at this point, uh, for this work, probably the youngest person was 13 years old, and but they're also nonverbal autistic. And so it kind of goes a little bit, I think, to what Jennifer was saying, because I've, I've had the opportunity to measure three different nonverbal autistic individuals who are 100% telepathic with their primary caregiver. And I think their abilities are partly due to the fact that they don't use verbal language. And so they don't have that barrier. I think the verbal language is actually a barrier. It inhibits our ability to tap into certain kinds of information because it's anytime we use language the way that we normally use language, it's limiting information. So I, I always use this example, right? Like how many world religions say you can't describe God, you can't talk about God, because as soon as you say anything about God, you've limited God. And it's yep, like- Pretty much all of them. Yeah, pretty much all of them, <laughs> yeah. right? And it's like chapter one of the Tao Te Ching, right? A lot you of know, Vedas too. <laughs> so. Right, for sure. And so, but I think it's a good lesson with other things too, because anytime we talk about something, we've limited it. And so I suspect that folks who don't have, are either aren't born with the, the sort of what we would say is sort of natural language ability, they might be more telepathic for longer just because that's, it, it's more, it, there's nothing to get in the way. Have you mapped regular people that have no psychic abilities at all? Because I've always wanted to go to oh, yeah. Oregon. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I've been mapping brains for 25 years, but it, it was all in sort of mental health kind sure. of perspective. So, But have you mapped someone who for sure has absolutely no <laughs> psychic ability? Because like I said, I'm, I, would lo I'm, I love Oregon. And I <laughs> I, I, I'll tell you what, you, you come out here and visit. We'll map your brain and then we'll zap your God spot Ooh. and see if it doesn't turn something on. Well, and I'll thwack him if it doesn't work. Can so you, one, two punch. Yeah, no, no, hang on, no, yeah. <laughs> can you elaborate on zap my brain, my god spot? Because that doesn't sound very fun at all. Oh, sure uh, it does. <laughs> I, I'm against electroshock therapy, just so we're clear. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I, I probably should use more more specific scientific language, but <laughs> so you can. And there's actually lots of research with this of using things like repetitive transcranial magnetic stimulation. You can pulse slow brainwave frequencies into the brain to temporarily shut things down. What? And so actually a study just came out recently where they did this with, this is a research study that was published in a peer reviewed journal. They applied RTMS to the left prefrontal cortex and then had people do telekinesis activities. And they were much more successful when they shut down the left frontal lobe. So we know that we can kind of shift the brain and kind of get it out of the way so that people can access this stuff more easily. Right. I guess that's the same general principle, but different from the binaural beats kind of thing where you uh, use different uh, wavelengths in each ear to activate a certain part of the brain. And, yeah, um, similar, but different. This is a little more sure. specified in binaural beats and, those, and other kinds of entrainment technologies are usually just increasing something, right? You're adding to, mm. but with other tech, you can suppress activity as well. Holy smokes. Oh. Guys, this has been fascinating. And we have just scratched the surface. And that is literally the biggest on the nose statement I have made in the show in three years of doing it. Mm -hmm. There's so much more to this. But what you have shared with us today is so truly earth shattering for me specifically, that I just can't imagine now going back to life the way it was before we talked. It's incredible. Good. Thank you. Look, we've changed your life. You have, <laughs> yes, yes, you have. And if you're listening or watching this show and this has touched you as much as it's touched me, love to hear from you. Let us know, what do you think about this? Is it, does it make sense? It, it, can you punch any holes in it? Is there, it, it, do you want to go to Oregon with me, right? There's so much to talk about this. I really would like to hear your thoughts because if it, it's touched me tremendously, I'm, I'm sure it must have touched many people out there mm -hmm. right now as well. Doc. Jennifer, thank you so much for coming on the show. We are honored and thrilled to have had you and be able to share your results with the world. And I know that this is just the beginning. So thank you for what you're both doing. I'm so grateful. Absolutely. Thank you both. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you for the universe conspiring with us because it's great to be back with you. 
and a huge thank you to you. If you know someone who would benefit from hearing the message we're sharing on the show, do them and us a favor and share the show with them. It will help get the word out about us and it might just change someone's life for the better. Well, that's all for now. But we'll see you on the next episode of The Skeptic Metaphysician. Until then, take care. Thank you.